uh, volunteers and uh, members of our organization here today. Um, also a member of the Historical uh, Association, our council, our council president, Horace Horton, right here in the front row. Uh, we have Assistant Scout Executive, John Carey. Our Council Commissioner, Lynn Teague. And uh, Troop 436 Alumni and Director, Ryan Cook. Uh, but we'll, we are proud to present you another uh, honorary Wilderness Survival Merit Badge. <laughs> It's been a wonderful experience for me. Uh, I've been doing this now for 25 years. Uh, I used to do it prior to that, but I had been in the service, couldn't do it and, uh, for like 30 years. And, and to the Boy Scouts. And Boy Scouts in those days mostly were run, were run in the churches. And my dad was in the church goods business, so, uh, and I hated to go. Guys, I have to put the uniform on, you know. And then I'd hide. I'd get there, there'd be basketball games, you know. And then I'd get there, and my dad would get mad because I sweaty, or I'd lost my hat, or something. Like that. <laughs> or I'd hide, or uh, and uh, I just needed going, and I just wanted to be with my friends and everything. So, but that that was an experience I think paid off at the end. In your experiences, what advice or thoughts would you give a twelve-year-old now? You guys lost thing in one place. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I could go through a whole litany of things, I, I would talk to Lee, starting from the very first time that you say as a leader, uh, okay guys, we're going to go up to Qatar this weekend. And of course the first thing you're going to thing you have to get permission from the folks. But then you go through a series of things, of preparation. I mean, you might have maps, you know, and you set up a buddy system, and you talk about safety, and you talk about what survival items we're going to carry, and all kinds of things. And uh, so I say, if you, and, and most leaders will do that. And uh, I, so I would tell the kids, pay attention. No, I was not a very good scout. That's pretty prevalent. And when, I, when they were given us instructions, for example, survival food, you know, can find in the woods, I was the kid in the back of the room goofing around, probably not paying attention. And I suffered for it, because we know what's available out there to eat, you know, in different things in different places. So I would say pay attention. And, and it's laughable it is saying one place, but don't lose your, lose your, it'll leave your group. Uh, things like that, you know. And listen to what your leaders are telling you. I go down on how many hundreds of schools and uh, even though a lot of the kids, I ask them, who's been in Mount Tartan? Uh, well, you know, you ought to go. But uh, then you say, how many campers? And all, all their hands go up. And they began to realize that Maine are outdoors people. And what I was going through, they could relate to. They know what the woods are like. They know all about the bugs biting. <laughs> and all of the things that, that I really struggled uh, along with. So. That's, that, to me, means that I think that the book meant a lot to And uh, now I get to uh, see a lot of Maine. I was up, I had a wonderful time last week, I was, or this past week, I guess, up at the Arcadia Festival. I have friends in a town called Soldier Pond, or Walla Grass, whichever way you want to call it, outside of Fort Kent. And, and I'm sitting there, and people are asking questions. I'm here you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to really great people, just plain people, you know, uh, not some CEO or something like that. I mean, just just people and had a wonderful time. They had a fair. They didn't bring in a carnival. They did everything themselves. We had a parade. It was unbelievable. Uh, it was bigger than Fort Kent and Solomon Walgreens. I don't know. But they're lucky if they got 500 people. Yes. No, they got more than that. People had... We had 45 minutes of fireworks. That more than Fort Bend had. Uh, it was just amazing. And I had one of the best times I've ever had up here. And I'm sure going back last next year, because they're going to have it. went so well, that they want to have it every year. So. <laughs> uh, our first grandchild at 13 years old went up Katahdin this summer. And countless nephews, nieces have been up the mountain. Everybody reads your book. 
and I want to thank you. Thank you. Very inspirational. Yeah, I've been up a mountain again, but for some reason they don't let me go alone. <laughs> <laughs> from the time young Don Fendler became lost on Mount Katahdin. New York State Troopers and their bloodhounds withdrew from the search yesterday, and the Maine National Guard was reported tonight to be on their way home. Now, those are the voice parents. Mrs. Fendler told the Associated Press, God in heaven brought my boy back safe to me. I think Don, he's alive. ...by hospital attaches and reporters. You know, we're making this film first and foremost for the people of Maine, um, but we also want it to go, I want it to be a representation of our state, and I want this to be, have somebody from North Carolina, California, somebody who's never heard the story, you know, like yourself, to be able to watch this movie, understand, you know, Don's amazing story, and then, you know, what our state is all about, people leaving work to go, you know, search for him, and what a big deal this was in the country, and in order to do that, the, the main obstacles you have to you have to cast somebody who has a recognizable name, and you know we could go out and make this film along the lines of, of, of what we've produced already, which was a micro budget. Nobody got paid. All the money that we raised was literally for equipment and food and fuel, and that was it. Everything was done on favors, um, and which we're still counting on for the state of Maine, um, because that's the only way this movie because making a period piece is extremely difficult, um, especially to be you know realistic, but. Um, you know, that's our main goal right now is to raise the money in order to film it and, you know, just making the movie in general, the general cost, but also to attract a name, a name actor so that we can spread Don's message as far as we, as we possibly can. Cause, because for me, you know, On Golden Pond is, is an older movie. It's, you know, it's not necessarily my generation. It's not necessarily a movie that the younger kids are going to watch these days. And then I worked on a film when I was in high school, Empire Falls. That was like my first, you know, with Ed Harris and Paul Newman. And that's how I kind of got into, you know, into, interested in movies. But um, that's not a great representation of our state because it shows kind of the poverty, the, the press nature, the mills closing down. So I, I want something to represent our state that's empowering and inspirational and something that's very iconic and for me this is that perfect story so um, that's that's you know that's the obstacle we have right now I want to make this movie for what's called a micro budget which is not that micro it's you know a million dollars that's that's it's a large it's a large sum of money but in the filmmaking world I work on studio films down in Boston that have a hundred million two hundred million dollar budget so for a million dollars you're literally looking to rent equipment pay an actor and pay, you know, your workers to work for you. Otherwise than that, locations, costumes, props, I mean everything in that everything that you see there, which I consider to be a lot of great production design. Everything was given for free. We went to antique shops, you know, that they let us borrow the stuff. All those uniforms came from Maine, uh, Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. They have an old storage shed with old old stuff. And and we'll be still relying on those types of things. Um, but at a certain point, you do need, you know, you do need to raise the money to, to put the film together. So that's what my big task is now. So it's been a process, but that's just the next phase.